have a format at Berea? <laughs> I was, yeah, I was unaware that we had a format here. Share that with me sometime, Mike. I've been here for 28 years and I ain't figured the format out yet. So, <laughs> we do have a format. There's always a method to our madness, I suppose. Everybody had a good day so far? Everybody get outside, a little sunshine? Um, Don, did you have a good day today? I didn't get outside in the sunshine. Oh, well, your job. Any day's a good day. Yeah, any day's a good day. Yeah, I, I, I worked outside almost all of my life, and this time of year, it's, one, it's just a great blessing. Spring and fall is great. Winter and summer, not so much. Uh, winter, summer, you're always looking at the people that are working inside, thinking, oh, they're so blessed, you know. But, uh, days like today, it's always good to be outside. Uh, before we get into our lesson, uh, I always like to make sure is anybody maybe that needs to make we need to make mention of and a lot of things happen between Sunday and you got an announcement to make. I have a new grandson. Okay. Lennox James. Lennox James. My daughter Ashley and her husband live in Cook. They had their fourth child. Cool. I I think seeing you saw it on Facebook when I looked at you and I said, Yeah, I know you've got an announcement to make. So there's a family we Play for us, Don. My grandmother fell yesterday, and uh, she uh, broke her ankle. And so they had surgery this morning to put her some screws in. And so uh, they're hoping she didn't fall and hurt anything else. But uh, it's the left ankle, so that's the side that was affected by her stroke that she had uh, in October. So, but uh, she uh, we're kind of got her left in. She's in uh, this weekend, but she's got a long way to recover, so uh, just uh, keep, keep in mind your prayers. You say she's in this fall today? Can't keep her down. Well, she's keeping herself down. Keep keep herself down. Right now. <laughs> we don't remember Danny too. Okay. He was in the bulletin. He's still in the bulletin. Yeah. What are you on the sick list? I think he was on the, like two or three weeks ago, he was added to that. 
I feel negative. Yeah. 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 That didn't reach, and I thought that's been like, I was thinking he was sick like a month ago. No? Okay, I'm thinking about somebody else then. Okay, I'm thinking about somebody else. Yeah, yeah um, y'all remember Angela, her name's not Hazelwood now though, is it still Hazelwood? Anyway, she was married to my cousin Frankie. Um, she's had a stroke, probably, probably she's probably not gonna make it, I'm gonna be honest with you. Pray for her and her family, but my mama's um, sister, my first cousin, Frankie and Larry and Jill, anyway, Frankie died about seven or eight years ago. Um, Larry, y'all remember years ago, his brother, Larry, after he got back from Iraq, they were both in the Marines, Frankie was old, but after he got back, there was some, some boys that dropped a rock on the boy going to Murfreesboro from here. I don't know if y'all remember, you know, that was my cousin. Spends all his time on the rack from over here and two boys drop a rock on him and kill him. And then Frankie, he died, my other cousin, and that's his wife, Angela. Now she has had a stroke. And of course, my aunt, Mama's sister, and then Frank died, her husband died right after Frank died. They've just, both her sons, her husband, and now it's just pretty, um, pretty hard road to hold. Yeah, they're faced with trying to make a decision now on whether to keep their, their mama on life support at 17, 20 years old. So, yeah, that's pretty bad. So remember then, Angela ha Hazelwood. I've got a microphone just tomorrow with a hematologist. Mm -hmm. They're masked up. And they're going to be there like real early that winter storm that you guys ride down there. Not either. But it's, uh, it's the flying up with multiple blood spots. So you going to the Nashville VA? messed up so bad right now, I'd hate to tell you how I'd go, but what time you got to be there? 9.15. It's not a bad time, but you got to go through there. Okay. Yeah, Let's pray about that. We pray about that too. Anybody else? Thank you. I'd forgotten that too. He's got COVID. I didn't think Warren had it the first go around. He's the only member of the family now he's got. It. So, yeah, I, thanks, Lola. Who else? Anybody else? Brooke Palmer. I remember her. Anybody else? Tim, will you lead us in a prayer tonight? Let's open up our Bibles and get back in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to start with verse 10. I'm going to read down a few verses here. Some things, I want to be honest with you about this particular passage and, and what we're going to be studying tonight, especially verse 14. Uh, I've admitted to most of you before that know me and know me for any time. There's a lot of things about the Bible I don't understand. But there's a passage here, especially in verse 14, and I will be happy to open up the floor to anyone who has suggestions. Um, and I'll, I'll share with you how I take it. But have you ever noticed, how many of y'all have ever, maybe as you're in your Bible study, you're reading something, and you come across something, you're like, I don't know if I quite understand that. And used to, 
course, it's a little different now because everybody's got a, an iPhone and an iPad. I had these big sets of commentaries, and you could go to there and you could look at the commentary and look at it. I have found in my years of, of, of trying to preach that most of the things that I struggle with, when you go to a commentary, they conveniently skip over that. Uh, they, it's kind of like, well, I don't really know either. Or, or, or I have found this too. There's one guy that I had. It's one of my favorite commentaries. He gets to something like that, and he'll start explaining it. And after about four or five pages of paragraph, you're like, I don't really remember what the question was. So anyway, we're going to talk about that. But, but I, one thing I want us to get out of this tonight is to continue the thing that we picked up on last week about Paul's what we build on, how we build, and how we're supposed to see ourselves as a team or a family. So I'm going to start with verse 10 of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And it pretty much picks up continuity-wise where we were last week. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation, using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If he has built, if what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one who escapes through the flames. I'm going to read just a little bit further. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple, and that God's Spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is sacred, and you are that temple. We'll stop there for a minute. Verse 18 kind of switches gears just a little bit. Let's back all the way back up. Paul, again, big on grace, talks about the grace that God has given him in verse 10, and he talks about the foundation that he has laid. Now, already early on in the last few weeks, we've talked about, in a minute, here in another chapter or two, he's going to start addressing some things that they actually wrote him about. That's not where Paul starts his letter. He starts it on the division thing, and a lot of them have been going around um, saying that I'm of Paul, and I'm of Apollos, so he tries to set, set them straight about that. We're not doing that. And he, he emphasizes the point here. He says, I have laid a foundation. I've laid a foundation for you to build on, for others to build on. Uh, Apollos, whoever, um, whoever happens to be teaching or preaching there in Corinth, whatever. But what, is, what does Paul say here, and again, before we get into something that maybe we can debate about or talk about later, when he says, I have laid a foundation, what does he make very plain that the, the foundation is as far as? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. And yeah, and he goes so far as to say, is there any other foundation? No. Now, that kind of, you would think, well, that's, that's pretty, kind of goes without saying, doesn't it? I mean, everybody that professes to be a Christian, right? Foundation is laid on Jesus Christ, right? Why do you think he goes into such detail about, but be careful how you build? There can only be one foundation. And as far as the church is concerned, let me ask you this before we go any further. The church of our Lord, as far as the components that make it up, the head and the body, what's the only infallible part of it? Well, the foundation, Jesus Christ. So we can build on it. You can't change the foundation. It's not going to change. It's firm. Paul makes it very plain. But he says, be careful how you build on it. How, is it possible to build on a perfect foundation an imperfect building? Yeah. Oh, I've seen it. I've seen it before. Now, there are other passages of Scripture, in fact, that we can see from, our, our, from the Lord himself. It's very important to have your foundation right, too. You know, vacation Bible school, about the wise man, good song, pretty elementary, but pretty sound advice. But that's not what he's talking about here. This foundation that the church is laid on is Jesus Christ, and he says there's no other foundation. But can you build something bad on a good foundation? Anybody here seen it? Because I have. I've seen it before. Uh, is it pot Let me ask you this before we go a little further. How important do you think it is, from Paul's word here, that our message that we put out to our community is consistent with the foundation? Why is it, why, and you're right, why is it critical? If we don't, what, what message do we send? Yeah, it's, it's, it's confusing. 
Um, if, if people will read you know, the words of, of Christ and then the apostles and the New Testament and, and the people he left behind to finish, finish the job, um, including us, if, um, if we're preaching and teaching something that's not consistent with the foundation, what are we telling people? Why do you think there are so many people in ha different houses of worship that profess to be Christians today? going to get your chocolate puppy to eat. And, and, and in keeping with that, I mean, I've seen the debates broaden even broader than that. It's just that you believe in God, you broaden even you know, a little bit further. It's a pretty broad umbrella when you start talking about it. You know, here's the deal, y'all. Everybody's got to give an answer for themselves. But um, the biblical definition of Christian is defined in the New Testament and what it takes to become one is, it is pretty narrow. It's not hard to do. Um, it's very easy. There's nothing, Kevin had a good lesson in Sunday, um, you know, <laughs> some of the things we're told to do, we don't have to understand them, and they may seem simplistic in nature. I'm thankful that they are. I really am, because he could have asked us to do great things, and, you know, some of us might not have been able to do it. So I'm thankful that it is, but sometimes we like to write off some of the simplicity as, well, it's just too simple, and we overcomplicate things. I think, and as far as Christianity is concerned and the foundation that Paul is, is talking about here, and this is not new in the 21st century. It was already happened in the 1st century. I think if you're not careful, we as people always, and it's, I think it's in our nature, maybe even an honest attempt to try to improve something. We hang so many bells and whistles and tassels and extras and stuff. It's kind of like when we buy a car, you know. You know, well, I want the, now it's, everybody's got AM, FM radio. How many of y'all remember when it was just AM radio? AM, PM, uh, we, act, we add so much to it that the foundation that, and what we build on it, people can't even, they really can't see Jesus anymore. It's just, it's obscured by all the things that we think have improved. Does that make sense? Yeah, Kevin. I think it, it's probably nothing new, but I see it in our world today. Uh, people are trying to find things that are appealing to others. So that what their niche may be is what they think people are hungry for or desiring, whether it's uh, the music that is going to be used, whether it's uh, what format you're going to have, and, and you get the list, it's huge what that is. But when we start uh, <coughs> deciding what we're going to do based on what people like and what people prefer, rather than it being on the foundation of Jesus Christ and Him crucified, when, when what we want is more important than what God says, that's, that's building on a foundation that is not, it cannot last. It's going to fall apart. The foundation will stay there, but all of the stuff that's hung on it will not. You mentioned that in your lesson too about when we started deviating on Sunday morning. Um, I, let me ask you this, and this is something that I've observed just what few travels I've had outside the country. Do you think maybe in our country, with it, as good as we have it, that um, our, our consumer mentality has drifted over into the church? It's kind of like Burger King, have it your way. Um, it, it, it's not any, a lot of people in the world, they're so hungry for just anything truth-wise, especially spiritually speaking, they're not, they're not playing that I, what's in it for me game. It's kind of like, I've talked to people before and even members of the Lord's Church that look at the Lord's Church as like a business proposition. It's like an investment. You know, I'm going to put this much into it. What am I going to get out of it? Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't worship and hopefully I'm here. I hope I go to heaven one day. If you want to look at it in that way, what am I going to get out of it? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like, what, what kind of return am I going to get on my investment as a materialist? What, what's it going to make me happy? 
And, and I've been, you know, I've been guilty of, you, you find and, and hear people make statements, you know, what did you get out of the sermon today? Well, it seems innocent enough, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing to say, but anytime the Word of God is read, you get something out of it. If you've listened to it, you're going to get something. Uh, the song service. Thanks again tonight, Don. I'm sorry, Ronnie, that's the other thing. That's the way it is. Um, you know, being critical of the song service or who led the prayer. Listen, y'all, that kind of nitpicky stuff, I don't like that. I don't like that. Uh, we're here to worship Him, and anytime there's a prayer that's offered in sincerity and for as a group or as our collective or as a song sung or Kevin preaches, whatever, you get something out of it. You just listen to it. And it's just like anything else. You're only going to get out of what you put in it. If you, if you start, and this is what is not new in our century either, if you see our worship as a spectator sport, then you're just a spectator. That's all you are. One thing I've learned is too, and I'm going to read a little bit further. Spectators, how many of y'all have ever have ever played ball? How many of you after the game have been criticized by a spectator? Okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> Talking about my dad. My dad would do that to me. Dad. Oh, Lord. I don't think he watches these online, but. I played, I played a game one time. Tim made 14 tackles. I'm going to brag on myself. 14 is good fashion. I, I'm, I was pull all pieces. Saturday morning, Dad gets me up because we were, I don't know what we were doing. We were doing some work. Gets me up about 6 o'clock in the morning. And you know what he told me? He said, you missed a block in the second quarter. <laughs> <laughs> That's a true story. Thanks, Dad. And he did, you know. He was there. He watched it. But no, the deal between being a spectator and playing, um, it's kind of like when you see the quarterback. Well, why didn't he see that man open? Well, he had a 250-pound linebacker trying to take his head off. You can see him, he can't. So in the, in the Lord's church, if you find yourself, I've got to finish this, move on. If you find yourself start using words like um, us and them or we and they, why don't, why don't they down there do this? Like if you're, if you're a member here at Berea and you tell everybody you worship at Berea, and you start saying, well, why don't they do this or that? And the they means Berea, well, then you're a spectator. Does that make sense? Because Paul's already said, we're all part of one big family. We're all part of one big team. So if you start using those terms, you kind of pull yourself out of the team and out of the family, then you're a spectator. I'm going a little bit further. Anybody have anything else? Well, I belabor that and beat that horse to death. If you didn't understand what I said there then, Kevin will explain it later. Uh, let me move on. It, again, go so far as to say that the, the one that's already been laid is Jesus Christ. That's verse 11. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, or costly stones, all right, first three things he mentioned. Gold, is it valuable? Then and now. Silver, then and now. I've got some silver dollars I've had forever. And... You gotta wonder about things like that. Dad gave them to me, his father gave them to him, and I'm gonna keep them too, so really what good are they doing? I, I, you know, I got some silver dollars. That's good, Lee. They're worth this. That's great. Are you ever gonna get rid of them? <laughs> Costly stones. I guess they could be diamonds, rubies, whatever. They worth something, yeah. So the first three things he mentions there are valuable. How about the, the, the next three things? Wood, hay, and straw. I've read this for years, and every time I read this, <laughs> you know what comes to my mind when I think about the wood, hay, and straw? This is crazy. Yeah. She just read that like a month ago to Tucker. We're, he's catching up on all of the, the, the books before we can't get them anymore. Um, so we, we read the three little pigs. Did you know they've already changed the three little, no, it's not three little pigs, it's Little Red Rock, uh, Riding Hood. You remember? Old school, original Grimm's fairy tale, and I've got an old book my grandmother gave me. The uh, wolf at the end, um, they cut the wolf, they kill the wolf, cut the wolf open, and, and the people jump out. Not anymore. Now they're hiding in the closet. <laughs> but yeah, these, these three things here um, are not as, as valuable. I want y'all to keep that in mind because I'm going to read into this portion of the scripture right here that I'm going to tell you. Uh, I have changed my mind about thinking about here two or three different times. So, three things that are valuable. Three things that not so much. And, and he uses them in his metaphor to talk about 
He builds on this foundation. So he's talking about the foundation's been laid and it's perfect. Jesus Christ, you can't have a better foundation. Now, if any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stone, or wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. What day do you think he's referring to here? Judgment. To me, it's got to be the judgment. And we'll talk about that some more in a minute because sometimes it's hard to reconcile that with what he's about to fix to say here. When he says it's going to be revealed, is it possible to build something and just halfway kind of eh, and build it? I've done it. How many of y'all have ever said that's good enough? That's good enough. There was a, <laughs> what do you say, it's just a barn? Um, my daddy, bless his heart, you never heard him say that. He's the only man I ever know that put a three foot level on a local fence post. <laughs> a fence post like this, you're going, he always said, everything has a plumb, everything has a center. Okie dokie, Dad. I tamp a little bit on this side and finally I said, come on. But anyway, and what did you do with that? Put a level on a fence post. But. <laughs> <laughs> There is a center to everything. It doesn't make a difference. There's, there is that, but what's your point? <laughs> Here, you can build something, even on a perfect foundation, and maybe not give it your best effort. Anybody in the church ever done that? Because I have. I have. And then again, maybe you on other occasions, or somebody else maybe that you look to and admire, do they always seem like it's 100%? They're building with Silver, gold, silver, and they're building materials. They're building materials with that. Keep that in mind, man. We're going to come back to me because, like I said, I am open for suggestions here in just a moment. It will be it will be revealed the, because the day will bring it to light. There's going to be a lot of things one day, y'all, that we could done, good and bad. Everybody's going to know about it, which is a very sobering thought. When you think about some of the things that I've done. It will be revealed with fire. The fire will test the quality of each man's work. Uh, if what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. Before I read verse 15, is that right? Make sure I got that. Before I read verse 15, what reward do you think Paul is referring to? An earthly reward? Eternal life. Yeah. I, and again, y'all listen, y'all. Y'all jump in there and help me out here because it, sometimes there's a passage here that's going to be kind of hard to, to wiggle that. It will, if it is burned up, which I guess would be an inferior craftsmanship or even the materials by which you built on the perfect foundation, if it is burned up, he will suffer loss. Yet he himself will be saved, but only as one who escapes through the flames. Now, and again, I definitely me and Mike talked about this on maybe yesterday. Mike was like, I own it. <laughs> no, no, he, he, was, he was pretty helpful. I, to me, and this is one of those passages I've got a question mark and I got like four or five different cross references to those passages. Here's the way I see it. I think there'll be some of us y'all that will make it by the skin of, skin of our teeth. I, I believe that. And I believe there's some that I guess have laid up enough treasure in heaven, maybe they maybe they're too. So I don't want to make it sound like that you're gonna work your way in or if there's some kind of, you know, master plan or you're on the A pass or something. I don't want to say that. I do think the Bible teaches that there are degrees of reward and punishment, even though I don't understand how that works. But he says that he'll be saved, but his works will be made known. I can think about there are some things, and, and, and I'm thankful for the blood of Jesus Christ and it washing us because it's like those things never happen. But I think about on the last day, some of the things that will be made known, and I don't know exactly how things, that's just a, a, a plane of existence I can't understand. Everything's going to be revealed. Does that make sense? And there will be things that I have done, I think it will be made known um, that I'm not, maybe not particularly proud of. I don't think it's going to keep you from going to heaven. Uh, I think. Well, the things that I have passed through the fire here because of poor decisions, of shoddy workmanship, I, I, I'm going to make it, but it doesn't mean I'm not going to pay the price here. 
You think you know people maybe that, or maybe you're one of them like me, who even now might be paying the price for some terrible decisions and choices and shoddy workmanship, even on the perfect foundation. And it doesn't mean God's going to hold against me, but I'm still passing through the fire here. Does that make sense? I'm paying an earthly price for that. Now, that's just something, and I have modified my thinking on this passage several times to try to reconcile the eternal principles that he's obviously talking about here and reconcile it with his works will be burned up, but he himself could be saved. Some of the things that um, I have built on down here, they need to be burned up. Just uh, Some of the things that are worthless that I don't need to hold on to need to be burned up. But everybody has to pay, pay a price. I think there's some people that make better decisions. They spend more time. They deal with better materials. They have their, their priorities in the right place. Um, but I think there, there are some of us like me that are maybe a little more imperfect that I think I'll make it too, but maybe not so much. Does Scott have? I'm sorry, Mike. I had a friend um, we had a conversation a while back and it, it, this conversation about you know God doesn't want us to be in sin to be trying to keep us from having a good time or doing anything like that he doesn't, he's not trying to he doesn't, it's not like he's saying oh I don't want you to do that because I want you to miss out on something it's because he knows what it'll cost us yeah. that, that he knows he knows that the sin or whatever, might, we might have joy for just a moment, but he knows it's going to hurt us. And that's, and I think that's what I'm hearing him say is that he's trying to keep us from the things that are going to yes. harm us, that making the making those decisions, yes, we'll still get to heaven, but, but life is going to be very difficult because of those decisions, because of those decisions. Well, he's a good father. And, and again, go back to Kevin's lesson, um, how, you know, a father treats his children, um, even whether it's prayer or anything else, he wants what's good for you, even though, even Tucker now does things, you know, that's not good. Uh, this morning, you know, Cindy's trying to get put shorts on, he wants to wear sweatpants. Well, he gets in the car this afternoon, he says, my legs are hot. <laughs> um, well, okay, next time, Hoss, you know, Goober, do what we told you to do. Um, our prayers, the same way, I have, you know, there's the, the prayer's answer is yes, prayer's answer is no, prayer's answer is wait a while. And I'm telling y'all, I finally, I know now because I have been the child and I have raised a, a wayward child and I'm now raising another child, there is another way God answers prayers. And I mentioned this before. You handle it. You got yourself into it, you handle it. And I think that's part of the fire here too. How many of y'all have told your kids maybe not, they've gotten into something Whatever it may be, it may not be a sinful thing. Maybe something getting over their head, money wise, or whatever. Instead of bailing them out, you do it. The lessons that I have learned that I remember, those are how I learned them. Um, Dad, he he give you a couple of chances, maybe. But if you still went off and you did something that's boneheaded, and you come back squalling and crying to him, I never will forget. I left the house first time. Said, Son, I'm gonna break the dinner plate. If you want to leave, be on your own. Make it. Of course, his mom come behind us. <laughs> I'm sorry, Kevin. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> she did well. That's why, Mom. That's what. That's what Mom said. Yeah, Kevin. I'm sorry. I've, I've always viewed this passage in the context of uh, the building here being done by those who are preaching this message. It is. That he, he's talking about people like Paul, Cephas, himself, and others, and he is comparing how men will build on that. Apollos had a flaw right out of the gate because he only knew the baptism of John. And throughout the centuries of time, there are people who have been building on that foundation, but they've been building things that are not the solid word of God. They've been building it with other things. And then sometimes people have, um, uh, they get focused on one little element and that becomes their focal point. And it, it diverts people and moves people in a direction that's, that's not exactly on the foundation. And I, I think the fire is twofold. I think there is the fire of persecution, that if we have built our faith and our teaching on the solid word of God, we will persevere and make it through. Uh, there was literally Christians burned to death. When we talk about the fire, they literally were burned to death. It, not only that, but the, the test of the judgment. 
Um, and there will be times in which people won't know and until the judgment when someone was an authentic teacher of Christ. That will be revealed. That will be revealed. Um, but uh, people um, that build on the foundation are going to have a more stricter judgment. Those of us who preach and teach are going to be held to a greater level of accountability than anyone else. Um, and there are going to be some people that maybe uh, got on their hobby horse and diverted people from uh, the truth, not because they were teaching falsehood, they were, they were minoring, majoring in the minors type of thing, and it drove people away. Uh, I've seen that happen. And, um, and so one day, everyone's work, everyone's ministry uh, is going to go through the fire, whether it's the fire of some event, some, something going on, um, or the judgment, either one, that the authenticity of what people have done will be made known. And I think that's an element of this. Uh, and you know, and, and again, obviously, because if you take it in context, it's already been talking about men that are preachers. I mean, that's where the division was starting there, starting to elevate. And, and the look at this too about when he talks about the temple, uh, uh, something I had confused and still do, as far as it being an individual thing, divided in the temple. When he talks about the temple here, he's talking about a collective body. I had an old preacher come in one time too, and I don't know if it was this particular pastor or not, but he was talking about the foundation. And you made such a good point here too, Kevin, about major and minors and picking one thing out exclusive. A good foundation, he, this guy, he just wanted to preach some of that, it's, it's got four corners, not one. You can't build on one corner or two. I guess you could on three. You want to have a three sides, but four corners, so it's the balance there. And he, he had a, a cross reference to the passage in Timothy, the, the four things that the word's profitable for. Well, he had a good lesson on it. Anyway, yeah, um, how many of y'all know somebody, or maybe you've heard a member of the Lord's Church, press, <laughs> maybe preach such an exception doctrine that they'll pull one or two points out of the Bible and teach that to the exclusion of everything else? Well, that's not very smart. I, I used the analogy once before, but, you know, I, I read, uh, had a book report years ago in Moby Dick, and I read the first and last, missed the whole thing, and uh, I got an F. Uh, you can't do that. The Bible's the same way. Old and New Testament, you've got to take it in context. We'll read just a little bit further, and then we'll quit. Uh, and again, in keeping with, uh, with what we just talked about, um, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? Now, it seems like it switches gears, but really you don't. How many of y'all have ever heard lessons taught, and rightfully so, because I've taught some this way too, that, that your body is the temple. Don't do anything to hurt your body because it's the temple. Chapter 6. True. Yeah. True. But what he's talking about here is more than just an individual thing. Your body is God's temple, individual. But also, what other body can there be that we're all individuals making part of? The church. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. Ouch. For God's temple is sacred, and you are that temple. Individuals, yes, but also, remember, he's speaking to a collective here. We, the, the group, the family here at Berea, y'all, as a, as a body, as a collective, are God's temple. Do not deceive yourselves. Now he goes back to his original thought about the true foundation, the one foundation, and when you're building on it, be careful in why you should not go to men and look to them. Do not deceive yourselves. If anyone thinks he is wise by the standards of this age, he should become a fool. So he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world, he's already had this passage before. It's actually going back to chapter 1, but it's almost verbatim. The wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight, as it is written, it catches the wise and the craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then, no more boasting about men. All things are yours. I love this. I, I love this. Why some this up. All things are yours. Whether Paul or Paulus, or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or the present, or the future. All are yours, and yours are Christ, and Christ is of God. Paul, to him, the importance of unity 
um, other than Jesus Christ himself, they, it was just paramount in his mind that the first century Christians understood how important it was to be a cohesive unit, to build on the true foundation, and that your message had to match that perfectly. It had to. Because if you if you go off one way or the other, he uses so many uses a team and a family, uh, a body, he uses a human body a metaphor, you know, how we all have to, to work together. And then he says this this item or this this idea of um, possession. All things are yours. Everything. Talks about things that aren't physical, future, past, things in this that are that are in this what in the world do you think he means by that? How can all things be mine? Past, present, future. You know, in our lives and in our minds, when we think of possessions, we automatically tie it to the to like a material, like a purchase, or maybe somebody gives us something like that. In Paul's mind, in, in his freedom in Christ that he had, he, he didn't think like that. He honestly believed that through Christ, everything in this world was his to use. Everything in this world was his. Now, however God chose to use it, use him through it, that was okay. And, and, and in his mind, this, this idea of whether it's Paul or Apollos or Cephas, talking about the men, or the world or life or death, present or future, all are yours. One of the things that we fail to talk about when we talk about the power of Jesus Christ and his blood is how it puts Christians in light and in perspective with world and world events around them. We get so caught up in that. Paul says here, it is yours. It is yours. So Jesus Christ, as long as you keep things in perspective, um, but we'll look at some more things that Paul says a little bit later on um, and some more passages that I, that I have struggled with because in Paul's mind, um, he had freed himself so much from the world that, um, I don't know the right word to use, he was so far above it that um, not only was it not important to him, but he, he had like a, a sense of ownership. And, and we use that term for Some team beats another team four or five years in a row. What's the term it's used? They what? They own it. Why? That's exactly right. And Paul talks about here, it's, they're yours. Because through Jesus Christ, you're above that. You're above it all. So that part um, is true. We're going to talk about another aspect what Paul refers to here too a little bit later on. I think I'll make a point there. Um, I guess I'll stop. Does anybody have anything else before? I try to appreciate everybody's comments. I, I love Paul's, um, Peter says a little bit later on in, in, the, in his epistle, one of them, some of the things Paul wrote about was hard to understand. And uh, some are. He was so educated. Some of the things he talked about were a little bit hard, but I appreciate the, having the, the, the Corinthian letters because today some of the things that Paul talks about are so, so timely. Uh, the invitation is extended to y'all tonight. I appreciate everybody being here. I don't know where you are at this point in your life. I know that uh, we mentioned some people earlier that are struggling with physical illnesses. Y'all do too, remember? I, I keep mentioning this. I'm going to keep mentioning it until maybe... I feel like everybody knows this. But, you know, there are folks out there that are suffering in ways that aren't so apparent to the human eye. Um, they are, they're really struggling with different things. There's hardly a, a week or two that goes by that I don't um, hear about or read about somebody who has, you know, taken their own life or they have just reached the point of desperation where they just don't feel like having it. You need to pray for them. I, it, it's... Um, Sometimes I feel like as, as, as Christians and members of the Lord's Church, through years, I grew up during a period of time where those types of, of, of sicknesses and illnesses were, were kind of like pushed aside or, you know, like it was some kind of shame. You don't have enough faith or, you know, listen, y'all, don't buy into that. But man, I'm going to tell you, if you bought into that, that's, that's the devil's lie. Uh, I had a doctor tell me one time that, you know, your brain can get sick just like your heart and your lungs can. So, you know, remember those folks. Uh, any other illness or, or struggles that people are having, um, try to bring them to our, our family here's attention and we'll pray about that. So that might be something that you're thinking about. Um, maybe it's something that spiritually you um, you need to get square. There's some things maybe that you've been doing that you need to stop doing. 
Um, and uh, I had brothers and sisters to pray about. Again, another spiritual sickness, but we can we can uh, we can do that for you too. So whatever your your needs are tonight, Jonathan's going to lead us in the song, and uh, together we we stand and, and sing. Jesus, the lovely shepherd, calleth thee now to come into the fold of safety, where there is rest and room. Come in the strength of manhood, come in the morn of youth, into the fold of safety, into the way of truth. Tenderly calling is he, wanderer, wanderer, come unto me, patiently waiting, there standing I see, Jesus my shepherd divine, Jesus the loving shepherd, in his dear life for thee, tenderly now he's called. Desire and 